Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. In the studios of our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today we're also on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. Today, via Facebook Live, as we broadcast each and every day, we're joined by our community partners. Today, with West Bloomfield Parks, Facebook.com slash WB Parks. Give them a like and join us on Facebook today for the Oakland County Megacast. And as always, joining me from her home studio in Kiko Harbor is Ronnie Dahl. Tyler, it is so cold out there. It is. It's really cold. It's terrible. I'm like, you know, if we had this weather maybe back in November, or no, not November, but like December, like around the holidays with all the snow, because it was very pretty to wake up and uh, see the new snowfall yesterday. Uh, but when you're out there with the dog, it's not so fun. It's a good thing you have cats, especially when your dog wants to just take their sweet time at six o'clock oh. in the morning and sniff around the neighborhood. Well, of course, you got to gotta, you know, read the mail as the dogs do, and they do that on the ground. But you know, it's six o'clock in the morning, freezing cold weather and, and wind. Not so nice. I, w- I took a walk off the street from where I live to the grocery store a couple of days ago, and uh, by the time I got back just to walk down to the store it's about a 10 minute walk and a 10 minute back i was inside for about 30 seconds maybe a couple of minutes at most and by the time i got back i was freezing because the sidewalks weren't entirely uh pl- no, plowed there's tons of snow everywhere it was blowing wind and it's freezing cold outside so it's been it's been bad lately it's it's been bad i will say i don't miss the days of having to stand out on the side of the roadway telling people it's really cold. Don't yeah. come out unless you have to. <laughs> As you're standing out there hours on it. Of course. Good times. So, uh, hey, uh, some good news though, uh, Tyler. Um, the uh, COVID cases in the state of Michigan, we are on a steep decline. Let's see how long it lasts after the Super Bowl though. Uh, Michigan reports the lowest coronavirus increase since this past fall. Uh, The state just reported 563 new cases of the virus Tuesday, the lowest single day increase since September 2020. And the first time the state has had a single day increase in case below 1,000 cases since October. Uh, The state did also sadly report 60 more deaths related to COVID-19, bringing the coronavirus death toll in the state to uh, just under 15,000 people. 31 of the deaths were identified through a vital records review, but it's still a good sign that we are moving in the right direction. And of course, the update comes as the state is continuing to stress to push to have residents vaccinated against the coronavirus. Uh, Beginning this week, a string of pharmacy chains here in the state are going to be uh, provided doses of the vaccine, allowing them to administer the vaccines making it easier for people and more accessible as well. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday in our headline portion that Meyer is starting to do some vaccinations uh, this week. Other department stores and grocery stores are going to be joining in on that as well in Michigan and throughout the U.S. So hopefully that helps ramp up the vaccination process, get the, those numbers a little bit closer to being back on track. And then as we get further on down the road, maybe one of these other vaccinations that may be approved in the coming weeks and months, like John, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's only one single dose, would also help with that. So hopefully all this continues to go in the right direction and we keep this good pace going right now with vaccines and with, of course, COVID-19 cases in Michigan so we can edge a little further along toward a solution here and maybe speed things up a little bit as we've had some hiccups that have put that timetable back a few months in recent weeks. Uh, yeah, I, what was the, uh, the latest um, is that for the rest of us, the general public, we're fall looking at uh, as the latest next fall. Originally, that number was going to be the springtime. Hey, is there any way that we can pop uh, Larry in, our Zoom producer? Uh, he went yes. in with his mother yesterday to get her vaccinated um uh, he his uh, experience wasn't quite as smooth as it was for Uh-oh. some of the people uh, going through the fire department 
uh, here in West Bloomfield uh, last week. Hey, Larry, can you uh, can you share your story that uh, you had yesterday? What was it like to get your mom vaccinated? Well, I mean, because that was the thing is, I-, I was unsure at the time exactly what the situation. We were just told to go to this, uh, you know, office uh, affiliated with a hospital. I don't want to name the hospital, but um, and so um, we had to stand. It, it almost reminded me of voting because we had to stand in a hallway of what actually would turn out to be was a former school. And so we stood in a hallway for at least 25, 30 minutes, and then it kind of winded around. And you know, almost like you were at the amusement park where you're like, you're, you're all of a sudden you're right next to people. And it just seemed a little strange to be that close to people in the middle of a pandemic when you're trying to go there to avoid getting the COVID-19, which is, you know, but I mean, it, the whole process took probably about an hour. But as you know, we had on last week, we had on Chief Flynn from the U.S. Bloomfield Fire Department. It was a nice drive-through situation. I was like the whole time thinking, boy, that would have been a much more appealing type of line to be in to be standing for with people, you know, for over an hour with people who were very vulnerable people. You know, it was mostly elderly people that we were in line with. So that's what I'm surprised about. It's like you said, you're with the elderly. They're the ones most vulnerable at getting the virus, but yet this is how you did it. But not only that, it's the standing in line process as well. Whereas even, you know, when you take your dog to the vet, you have to stay in your car and then they come out and get you. So I, I don't know why they wouldn't uh, try something like that. So yeah, and, and then the thing that it, it, it did strike me that so it was so many elderly people who have been just cooped up for the last year. So everyone is striking up conversations. The gentleman behind me was a very nice man, a 92-year-old World War II veteran, and he just wanted to keep talking. I'm in a conversation. We're both masked up, but you know, is this really the proper thing that should be going on right now? I don't know. That is, uh, that is a good point. Elderly people, it's like you said, you know, when they start telling their stories and I will say if I'm standing in line next to someone for that long, I'm going to know at least the, you know, four or five people around me. <laughs> but uh, we're glad that your mom is okay and that she was able to get the vaccine. I know it's been a little bit frustrating uh, trying to even get signed up, signed up and get an appointment. And so many people are feeling that same frustration, uh, Larry. Uh, also making news today, just great to always have the perspective from individual going, individuals going through some of these uh, processes, um, Tyler. Yeah, it's different everywhere. And you know, there are complications that come with every process that we have in uh, in, in our modern times, what there are complications with testing, there's complications with, of course, COVID-19 screening processes, and of course, now with the vaccination and trying to get as many people as you can through a system in order to be able to get vaccinated efficiently, uh, that can cause some issues too. And that's why we, and I like that Larry brought up the conversation we had last week with Chief Greg Flynn about the drive through COVID-19 vaccinations and why the county was starting to do those and really liked having that as a format. And part of that was it allows you to stay in line and and keep your distance and keep warm without being lined up outside. You still have some long lines. It's still very much a team effort that needs to be ran efficiently, but it keeps people at a distance. Whereas Larry compared that to going to the polls on election day and standing in line next to people, striking up conversations while everybody should be masked in, in that situation. We see often in other places where we have to go into public gatherings, such as the grocery store, the drug store, wherever it may be, that some people don't wear their masks correctly or don't keep their distance or are or simply are not wearing masks or are not feeling well and still go out in public. So there's always those risks there. And that's why our, our county and other counties are trying to figure out ways to continue to do vaccinations efficiently, but also safely. Right, they're learning as they're going. Uh, hey, Oakland County has a new program that they're starting, Tyler. Uh, they're going to be partnering with a Rochester-based software development company to try to help it make it easier for restaurants and schools to adhere to the state of Michigan workplace safety guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. The county has signed a five-month contract with clear to go for use of its software and smartphone app that helps ensure people entering a school or restaurant are healthy and adhering to state and local health protocols. The app will be used by schools and restaurants to screen employees and guests, 
collect the information for contact tracing and case management purposes, and to manage employee availability and visitor presence as well. County is paying between $500,000 and $750,000 for the cost of the software. That money is coming from the Federal Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act dollars, the CARES Act dollar that was passed by Congress this past uh, December, which keep in mind, that's our tax dollars but it's just another way that they're trying to come up with ways to make it easier for some of the schools and the companies to follow these rules and regulations. And hopefully it will come with updates as well because the information does change on a regular basis as well. Yeah, hopefully it'll come with some, some more information as, as time goes on and to the effectiveness of this. I mean, paying 500 to $750,000 to use this, this software from CARES Act dollars, which of course, as you said, are taxpayer dollars. You want these things to be helpful, not just something that works and makes things easier, but be helpful and make things more efficient and more effective in treating uh, this current situation and getting a better understanding of how people are interacting with one, one another, who has been where at what time in case of contact tracing being necessary. But five hundred thousand to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars—that's a lot of money to spend on something if it's not going to be exceptionally effective or helpful in battling the COVID-19 pandemic on the local level. So hopefully, as time goes on, we get some positive news about the effect that this software has had. That being said, I don't entirely see how this is more helpful just on the surface of this story to the efforts that have already been in place than what's already there. Well, the press uh, releases um, posted on the Oakland County website, and they don't really don't get into details as yeah. to how this is going to work or how it's going to be different. Remember, we also have that My COVID app for people, and uh, that has been shown to uh, very few people are actually using and utilizing that app. So it seems like maybe they could have tried to team with the state in another regard. But we do know some of the universities are using similar programs. Uh, Oakland University has like the bio button. So uh, there are ways to use this. It's just going to see how what the rollout is because in the press release, it didn't give information about how restaurants um, and schools can sign up for it. But I'm sure that'll come down the road as well. Hey, uh, no surprise here, uh, Tyler. When we're talking about our elected leaders, the fight continues over the money. The governor to the GOP released the COVID uh, re um, release aid without strings or vaccinations are going to suffer. So the governor said Tuesday that time is of the essence and urged the Republican run legislator to appropriate federal COVID-19 relief dollars without strings to better fund the vaccination efforts here in the state of Michigan. The request comes after both the state house and senate introduced supplemental spending plans that hold back some of the federal funding approved by congress in december both chambers indicated the funding would be doled out gradually to maintain spending oversight the democratic governor though had proposed a five billion dollar supplemental spending plan while the house plan came in at 3.5 the senate's plan about two billion dollars with the B. Uh, House Speaker Jason Whitworth uh, defends the GOP's plan, saying, despite what the governor said, our plan simply refuses to throw all the money in at once. It's not what we do in our households, and it's not what we're going to do with this hard-earned taxpayer dollars. We're going to be careful, responsible, and accountable. There is a point to be made there. And at the end of the day, remember, it is just that, our taxpayer dollars. Yeah, you got to be smart with how you're, how you're spending the, the state's money, especially in uncertain financial times and tough financial times. You want to make sure that there is efficiency in that process. That being said, there's been a lot of time and a whole lot of money that's been spent by the taxpayers paying our politicians, both in the governor's office and in the legislature, the Republicans and the Democrats in Lansing, to figure out solutions together in this pandemic. And neither side has made a true effort to compromise, at least not clearly, and in a way that the public can see. So if you want to talk about efficiency, it's got to go all ways around. Solutions have to be found, negotiations have to be made, compromises have to be negotiated, 
and made and arguments need to stop because those arguments are also happening on the taxpayer's dollar. Uh, so, and of course, one of the things that's at the heart of this, the uh, some of the Republicans want to take the power away from the health department and the governor's office and allow for school districts and local health departments to try to make some of these decisions rather than making them a statewide mandate. And so they're saying, hey, you play with us on this issue, then we'll release some more dollars. And the governor is saying, no, I want all the money now. We need to get it out to the people. But we also have to keep in mind um, some of this money, like while they're throwing around these dollars at a press conference, a lot of the money that's intended for the people that really need it, like some of our restaurants, our small businesses and workers that are laid off, a lot of them aren't seeing this money because while it sounds like a lot, you know, there's not really enough to go around to fit the need of what's happening as well. Yeah, there's a lot of factors that are going into the funding that is going to be needed. There's a lot of factors going into the negotiations of these funds. Like like the uh, like like the uh, House Speaker said, they do need to be careful. They do need to be responsible. They do need to be accountable. But they also need to be prudent and they need to be fast in getting this legislation through and, and getting this relief out to cities, to businesses, to people in Michigan that are struggling at this point in time and delaying vaccinations at, uh, in, and that whole process as a result uh, of negotiating ploys and trying to pull things back to toward your side of the aisle or threatening to withhold negotiation tactics such as relieving some of these regulations that are in place or giving greater input, it's not helping the problem. So you can find the latest headlines if you go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus, the tab, and that's where we list the latest headlines each and every morning. And also at the top of the page, you have direct links to some of the resources, including the Oakland County website. So you can go on to their website and read directly about some of these measures that they're taking here locally in our community to try to help all of us survive the pandemic. We have a great show ahead of uh, for you today. What is today? Today's Wednesday, right? It is. It is Wednesday today. I, it, it, I really is like Groundhog Day. I can't keep track. I just can't keep track. But today on our show, when we uh, come back, we are going to be speaking with the um, the head chef and the farm manager over at the Sylvan Table. It's going to be a new restaurant opening in Sylvan Lake. I'm so excited to talk to them because I've been watching their progress and I cannot wait for it to open. We'll also be speaking uh, with the executive director for the Scarab Club and also Mandy Jean, she's a bartender over at the Brew House. We'll check in with her to see how things are going now that they've been open to the public for about a week. And also our good friends over over at the Center for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine will be on with us in the 11 o'clock hour, as well as Linda Charter. She is with the uh, Melaluca, the wellness company. It's an independent marketing executive, but she's also a member of the uh, Chamber of Commerce here in the area. So a lot to get to on this Wednesday after this quick break. I'm uncomfortable. But so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 
together. Together. For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. As a reminder, you can always catch Tyler and myself Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. You can tune in to Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Also, if you have cable, uh, Comcast Channel 1599 on AT&T. If you're out driving around, tune us into the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, the BIP. And we also want to say thank you today to the West Bloomfield Parks Department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. This has been a very tough time for so many restaurants. They are struggling to stay afloat, but it has not stopped the progress of one restaurant that I am so looking forward to opening here in our area, the Sylvan Table. And with us now is going to be uh, Chris Gedalka and Christina Pro. Is it Procoli? Procoli. Procoli. Yes. Did you used to do yoga over at uh, Lifetime? Yes, I did. Ah, I thought I recognized your name. Uh, you're the farm manager over there at the Sylvan Table. It's great to have you both with us. Thank you. It's great Thank to be you. with you. So I pass by it so often on the trail, and I've been seeing the progress. Where do things stand right now? So we're about um, a little under a month from construction completion. Uh, we're anticipating finishing construction and having the restaurant turned over to the management staff and myself uh, around the beginning of March. Um, from that point, it is just finishing certification, standard um, health department inspections that are all required for pre-opening, and especially now uh, with you know COVID and ensuring that you know everything that we do is perfect and up to snuff. Um, and then after that, we are. Uh, we begin training our staff. Uh, we're gonna do a three week pre-opening training to ensure that when we're open, everything is perfect. Not just the service, but all of the protocols that have to be in place, uh, as well as the food. Um, you know, every piece of equipment will be tested, vetted, cleaned. And you know, that, that's something that um, in opening a lot of restaurants through my career, isn't typically done. Um, but we wanna make sure that, you know, because it's such a unique time. It's a unique situation and the building is so spectacular as well as the entire property that, you know, nothing short of perfection is, is what we have when we open. So we're, you know, we're making sure we take our time. We're anticipating opening somewhere, uh, somewhere mid-May. We don't have a firm date yet. Obviously everything is still waiting on construction. That's why we don't want to set anything just in case something happens, you know, especially with delays in shipping or, you, know, you name it. There's there are a lot of a lot of variables, but we feel that that is uh, a pretty accurate uh, model for us right now to say you know mid May we're going to be open. It'll be warm out. We'll be able to use the outside patio. People will be you know coming in, and it'd be it'd be quite exciting. It's it's exciting right now. You know so. It, fingers crossed it'll be warm. <laughs> May, yeah, that's true. In Michigan, we still don't know. But with that, um, Christina, before I jump over to you, uh, Chef Chris, I have to say any 
hesitancy or change in plans because of COVID? Because obviously uh, this was started and in, in progress long before yeah. COVID. Uh, but I remember the discussions, you know, the planning, trying to get that piece of equipment or that piece of land rather there in Sylvan Lake. So what has changed during, because of COVID? Yeah, so I mean, and you're right, the whole process is at least three years, if not longer right now. Um, and in terms of restaurant wise, I mean, obviously we're looking at what the restrictions are for COVID right now. Uh, everybody's at 25% with an anticipation somewhere in the beginning of May to be 50% indoor dining. Uh, that could or could not happen. That's going to depend. And we're, we're ready for both. However, in lieu of that, uh, our, our, our outdoor patio uh, structure, all of the concrete is already built in with heated concrete. So we will have um, that at our capability that will seat an additional 80 people and outdoor dining has always been open uh, so we'll, we'll be able to use that four seasons round um, you know we we just have to put tenting over the top to make sure uh, if it rains people stay dry because that's important but because of the size of our property we have five total acres uh, two and a half dedicated to the to the restaurant and parking lot and then two and a half dedicated to the farm we have plenty of room to continue seating outside uh, and, and serve any guest that really wants to come in. Um, so, you know, the precautions we're taking are pretty standard in, in, lieu, of, in lieu of the situation. Um, you know, we, we'll be able to appropriately socially distance everybody uh, and that will come in terms with the training that we're setting everybody up with. Um, but our biggest things that we've seen have just been, you know, delays in construction, ensuring that everybody is safe on property, social distancing on property, you know, everybody is doing everything according to what the health and safety standards are. And then, uh, you know, just getting through the whole process. And, and that's really been, been the major things that we've seen. So just the, the, the standard delays and things like that. But the plan that the owners uh, have put together has been nothing short of amazing and well thought out all the way through. Uh, so, you know, I mean, we're, we're anticipating obviously an impact from, you know, uh, the seating as we possibly, you know, we possibly aren't anticipating to open at a hundred percent, but being a new restaurant and opening at 50% indoor and a hundred percent outdoor is still beneficial for us because how many restaurants have you been to that have opened and they say, don't go to a new restaurant, you know, within two to three months of opening. It's because they're taking too many people. They're not doing a great job. The focus isn't there on, you know, that guest service. Well, 50%, that's all we can focus on is our guest service and making sure everybody who comes in has an amazing time, um, you know, is, is floored by the experience and just wants to come back. So, you know, we'll be able to, to provide that. And so we're going to look at it as a benefit for us in, that, in terms of that. This is silver lining. It's just how we look at it. Uh, with Christina, I love the concept of the farm to table. And there has been a big push already about local and buying local, but this is a bit different because the farm is right there. How will you pick what to grow and to utilize um, to get it from the farm to the restaurant? Well, um, we're going to focus on seasonality. Um, what's really great is collaboratively, Chris and I are working on to get what is the best in the peak of the season. Um, and also to educate the community about what's available during these times, why we grow them at these times. Cause you could grow greens in the spring and they're gonna taste very different from growing specific greens in the fall. And that's because of temperature. So it's just, it's a, it's a really great experience to offer learning to the community and we'll work together and making um, interesting, uh, dishes that will come from fresh ingredients right from the farm so it, it literally it's being grown washed 50 more feet and it's in the restaurant 10 more feet it's on your plate um, so when you're talking about like a food system that's a very small circle of impact so our, our carbon footprint is minimized tremendously so is there any thought as well to maybe making uh, some type of farmer's market at that area, like a small market um, to utilize some of the crops that maybe aren't used in the restaurant? I think potentially that is a possibility right now. We really want to focus on putting everything for the restaurant and then as well as creating value added items yeah. um, because we will have a little retail space. So anything that there is overage, we are going to process um, whether it's gonna be dehydrated or fermented. 
Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunity for the produce that I grow to, to get used fully. Um, and if there is waste, we, we will have um, chickens on the farm to help navigate some of that, um, as well as increase some of our fertility on the farm as well. So we're really excited for this all kind of one organism system. I'm excited. I'm just, yeah, I'm selfish. I live in the neighborhood. So I'm, that's why I'm like, no, you know, you need like a little farmer's market too. We can just walk there instead of going to Pontiac. So, you know, Christian, what's your background? How did you get into this? Um, I'm formally educated in fine arts and art education. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate to switch my career into health and wellness. And I mentored under a, uh, she's a local farmer here actually in Detroit, Gwen Meyer. Um, and for five years, I did urban farming with her in the city of Detroit and kind of got my legs underneath me enough to go get 10 acres north of Flint, uh, where I spent another five, six years learning to really farm in a, in, in a full or larger scale. Um, and I was fortunate enough to meet the Ryans uh, and this project. This is a great project. I really think it has the potential to reshape this entire area. We need restaurants and, and quality, great restaurants. And we have a few, you know, um, Pepinos moved into the area after the fire at their other location, and it was going to be temporary. And here all the years later, they're still around because there is a big need right now. Instead of going all the way to Detroit, let's mm -hmm. have some yeah. restaurants right here. And so with that, um, uh, Chris, as the executive chef, how do you start a menu? Uh, what is that process? So actually, it's... So I've been working on this. I've known about the project for uh, just over a year now. And once I found out about the project prior to even, you know, interviewing or getting offered a position, I had already started working on potential menus, just ideas, you know, because stuff, something like this is exciting. Uh, once I met the Ryans, um, a lot of it was uh, understanding what Tim and Nicole's vision was for the structure, the farm, uh, the restaurant, what their what their goals were, and then from there uh, we put together a base menu. Um, you know, ideas of what we thought what would be in season, and you know, the, the theory of this menu is going to change pretty f frequently. But it's not going to be like a wholesale change where you come in one one week and then the next week the entire menu is different. Think of it more like a Ferris wheel, where you know the people on top of the Ferris wheel, if they attempt to get off, they're going to have a really bad day. But you know, everybody at the bottom. It's, you know, you get one car off and then you, you put something new on and then it goes a couple more cars and that that'll come off and then something new will come on. And that's that's how we're going to treat the menu, because, you know, on our on our whiteboards and on our planning boards, we'll know what's on deck to be harvested. We're, we're going to know what's in peak selection and we'll have tried it, tested and come up with a with an idea that works with the season, uh, works with the cultures that are in the Metro Detroit area. Um, you know, we're, we're going to kind of draw from everywhere and find out what way to best present the produce that we're getting, the proteins that we're getting, um, you know, to make those the star of the plate. And in turn, because of that, you know, you'll constantly see something new on the menu and something will, you know, will come off until the next time it's available. Um, you know, the, the example I tend to use is cranberry harvest happens, you know, for one to two weeks a year in the Sheboygan area. You know, and that that's it. So when that happens, we have to take advantage of that and get as many cranberries as we can use for for the amount of time. And then then they're gone until next year. You know, you, you will not, unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, my view is fortunately, but you will not see a tomato on the menu in January. It just it's just the worst. You know, I mean, there's no real flavor. They're watery. They're they're, they're all of this. But you get into July where you start getting the, the cherries and the grape tomatoes. And then you get into August where, I mean, that's where Michigan hits the peak tomato season in September, where quite frankly, our tomatoes are, are the best in the world. Um, you know, that's when we're, we'll have some phenomenal dishes that represent that. Or when pawpaw season happens in Michigan, you know, we've got three weeks to present that. The opening menu that we're looking at now, I mean, we're gonna open with ramps, fiddle, Eastern fiddlehead ferns, uh, morale mushrooms, they'll all be in peak season. And by three weeks later, they're gone. So we have to present those in such a way that capitalizes on the flavor, gives people an experience that you know they can't find really anywhere else. 
and, and does things in a way that's respectful to the environment, the food is sustainable, there's minimal waste and you know everybody gets a phenomenal meal. I'm so excited for the restaurant to, to open here and it's going to be in our own backyard. Right now though, so many restaurants are also struggling yeah. finding quality workers. Are you worried about that at all, especially with the type of food you're going to be serving? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that was uh, that was a worry for me in prior incarnations too. In the restaurant industry, there's been uh, a noted labor shortage or labor movement for the last two to three years, uh, you know, year even before COVID. Um, one of the things we are seeing now is the people that are coming to work tend to be loyal, uh, more loyal because this is their livelihood. They understand it. They have a passion for it. Um, some of the temporary workers that we're using it for, um, you know, temporary sustainability have moved on to other endeavors. So the, the workforce that we're getting is definitely more driven and more focused. Um, you know, we do have a concern about that, but we're starting our hiring process early. We already know the amount of staffing that we will require. Um, I'm, you know, I'm blessed to be able to work with the, the people, you know, our owners, Christina, um, you know, my general manager, Steve Singleton, uh, you know, they are phenomenal people. And, you know, we, we know quite a lot and I'm already getting interest in uh, hourly associates coming to work because it is such a unique project. Um, you know, not only are we providing a great environment of, you, of pretty unique cooking styles. I mean, we're, we're going to be live fire in the kitchen, uh, you know, so everything, everything's going to be off of wood fires. But, you know, one day, one day a week, uh, my kitchen staff has the opportunity to go and work in the farm and educate themselves with Christina. And that's not an experience that people can get somewhere else. And that education will help, um, will help you know, my, my associates in their future endeavors. Um, it, it'll help make them smarter, more educated and, you know, better chefs in the future. And that's, that's exciting for me because we want it to be obviously a functional kitchen, but we want it to be educational, you know, that, and that's one way we provide added value other than just, you know, paying people well, it's, you know, providing them with more, you know, with that education, with experiences that they, you know, won't possibly experience someplace else, but it'll give them value as they, they move on in their careers. And what a so work life balance to have you know, one day you're in the kitchen and it's, you know, a, a busy night. If you're in the food industry, you know what that's like. And then the next day you get to be uh, out in the field or in the high tunnel, you know, working with the earth and learning. So I, I think that's a really nice uh, offering. I wish I, I would, I would apply for a job like that. You know, one thing because of COVID, we have seen there has been a lot more attention from the general public about where their food comes from. And with that, Christina, you had mentioned that uh, you were part of the urban farming movement in Detroit. And do you think that and all of the attention that Detroit has gotten with their urban farming um, attempts has really kind of helped fuel some of these projects? Absolutely. I think, you know, the pandemic has exposed and brought some light to things that people have not thought of before. Um, and, and yes, they may think, oh, shop local as kind of a peripheral thing, but really the deeper lining of that, they're noticing when they can't get their shipments or their grocery store can't stock these things. And people are resourcing now from local farmers, which is great. And I mean, not only does it help support our smaller local community and our, our, our business like that, but it's also just regional eating for health and um, freshness. I mean, when you think about uh, an apple, we have apples here in Michigan, but apples coming from Washington. So it's picked at a time when it shouldn't be picked and then it's transported and the hours and refrigerated truck and the energy and the gas and the carbon impact. And, and finally, when it gets to the grocery store, then it's sitting there waiting for the consumer to come and get, there's, there's quite a lot that happens in a reduction of nutrient density to those things. And so now we're, we're people are recognizing that now, now that they're eating more local because they're like, oh, I can't get that from there. I'm gonna supplement with this. And they're like, oh, this is actually really wonderful. And organic uh, is the way to go. Hey, uh, Chef Chris, just another uh, couple minutes here with you and Christina before we have to let you go. Uh, I have to say, um, I've seen some of the videos of you uh, on the Chef Clash <laughs> in Birmingham. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, have you thought about your own uh, TV show? Oh, uh, 
No. <laughs> I mean, those, I'll be honest, those were a blast. And I, I look forward to, you know, in the future doing stuff like that again. I, I would, you know, I was honored to be invited uh, for all the years that um, I was, I was able to attend those. And um, I'm kind of humbled that you, that you think I'm moderately okay enough to potentially do, you know, TV for that. It's, I'm kind of speechless right now. Oh, um, you're a manager. <laughs> but you know no thank you um but you know there was there's a lot of great chef talent in detroit and uh you know nationally it's it's just starting to get recognized by james beard um it's not recognized yet by michelin um you know i'm hoping that someday it does but you're, you're seeing more you know i mean we we just have we just got another top chef competitor um and you know she is outstanding. I'm looking forward to seeing you know how well she does, and you're seeing just a proliferation of amazing young, talented chefs that you know have come from our local culinary schools, that have come just from their own experience and their drive to want to want to be better and provide more and just give the great hospitality. Um, you know, I'm just humbled to be part of it and you know working with the same group of people and you know the, the same chef mentors the or, you know, with everybody else, but, you know, as for TV, maybe, maybe one day in the future. I, you know. We'll definitely be doing <laughs> classes though. Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll be doing culinary and, and agricultural workshop. Yeah. Offering Otter, classes. Otter restaurant. You yeah. Know, the whole deal. And I'm, you know, looking forward to it. So. See, that, because really it, um, all of these cooking shows, I mean, we have cooking channels 24 seven. It has okay. really um, helped spark a next generation. I mean, when you have kids that are eight, nine, 10 years old, they are amazing. And a lot of that has to do with the new attention from the cooking shows and oh, yeah. Yeah. really so that passion. When I, when I started in the industry, if you could put an eight ounce protein, some mixed vegetable and a starch on a plate, you could be a chef and you got paid $35,000. If you had a foreign accent, you got paid $45,000, you know, and then Food Network came out and everybody you know the, the general public that, that has never cooked a day in their life they got interested in it and they became so much more you know intelligent with their selections their choices you know what food was what you know you, you watch the diversity of the food that you know came into the metro detroit area let's face it it was a, it was a big meat and potatoes town in the you know in the 80s um, and still kind of weaning away from that in the 90s and early 2000s. And now, you know, I mean, you are looking at exceptional restaurants that are just vegan, that are just Hispanic oriented, that are just Asian influenced. And, you know, that was so spotty back then. And now, you know, people are embracing it and they know what's on their plate. And they, you know, most of the time, the guests know more than what you know. And that's so exciting because you have to really be on top of everything you're doing and make sure it's just perfect because you just don't want to be inauthentic to any of your guests or any of your patrons. Well, we're excited to, for you to open. If you ever need a taste tester, I'm just a few blocks away. Oh, you, okay. you will definitely be there and we are looking forward to having you in. Well, uh, thank you again to the both of you for taking time to be with us. Um, again, uh, it's springtime, um, that's when it looks like the Sylvan Table is going to be able to open to the public and we look forward to it. Uh, running a few minutes late, we're going to take a quick break and then when we come back, we'll be speaking with the Executive Director at the Scarab Club. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. 
Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. We appreciate you taking time out of your Wednesday to be with us here on the Mega Cast. Excited to bring in our next guest, Marianne Wilkinson. She's the executive director for the Scarab Club in Detroit. It is an amazing building, but also you guys do amazing things there in supporting the arts. For those not familiar with the club, give us a, a little bit of history. Oh, hi, Ronnie. Thank you for having me on again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, the Scarab Club is a 111-year-old arts organization. It was started in 1907. Uh, we moved into our current building in 1928. We're right across the street from the DIA. We're on the corner of Farnsworth and John R. Streets. And we are a, an organization that meant, that's meant for artists. We were started back in the old days by a group of advertising executive actually who were interested in finding a place where they could hang out together and learn to draw better and do some things together and it eventually became a club um, and it's known as the scarab club because it was originally named after its founder but it was now known as the scarab club because you remember how in the early part of the 20th century there was this great interest in everything Egyptian. You know, that's when King Tut's tomb was found and everybody was all excited about that. And so they named it the Scarab Club as a symbol of rebirth. You know, how many times we've talked about rebirth in our city. Um, so we do exhibitions. Uh, we have a, a artist members. We do classes and concerts. We do all sorts of things to um, attract artists and people who are interested in art in our community. So it's a very lively and vibrant place all the time. And we've, we're, we welcome everybody to come. It's not a club in the sense that it's exclusive, but we're open to the public and we invite anybody to come and see what we're doing. And so you have evolved through the time as well. You have a special um, program going on right now in honor of Black History Month. Can you share that with us? Yes, we, we, one of our goals, especially over the last decade, let's say, has been to really reach out and involve more members of the community than the club was known for previously. And so, you know, we've done a number of shows of, of Indian art and Black art and um, Middle Eastern art all, you know, and Hispanic art, all kinds of things from the community. But we had never done a show for Black History Month before. And we've never done a show that has exclusively Black artists. So the show that's up right now is called The Souls of Black Folks. And it was organized by a local artist named Donna Jackson. And Donna brought together the work of 19 Black artists from our community to think about what it means to be Black in 2021, what it means to be Black in Detroit. Um, and it's a very moving touching, interesting, thoughtful, and really beautiful exhibition. Art really does tell a story and it's also documenting history. Mm -hmm. uh, what about this show taught you something new that maybe you didn't know? Well, every time I look at work and especially a group of work that comes together like this, that is from a culture that is not mine, I learned something. And there are so many powerful works in this show. One major work is by Carol Morisot um, that, that documents the many black people that have been killed um, in unrest in, by police um, by painting small portraits of them and inserting them in this big wall of ribbons. And it's such a beautiful and moving tribute. Um, it's the sort of thing that I would never, I mean, I'm not an artist myself, but I would never consider doing, but it really brings the point home of how, 
how we need to look at this as individual people and learn from each other, think about each other as humans sharing the same spaces. You know, it really is powerful when you think about, uh, you know, your club's been there for more than 100 years, but yet we're still addressing some of the same issues as a community and as a country as they were happening 100 plus years ago in our nation. Yeah, yeah it never really, it never really goes away in, in that sense, I guess. I don't know. But the, I mean, when you think about the club and its long history, it was founded in 1907, as I said, and it wasn't until the 60s that women could be members. So, you know, it, it, took, a, it took a long time for women to, to, to join. I don't, I don't know when African-Americans could become members. I, that's something that I need to find out about, but I'm sure that it was not, it was probably after that. So in the last few years, we've really tried to to bring a multicultural focus to the shows that we do at the Scarab Club to recognize the fact that we have this highly diverse uh, community of artists and of people who, who gain from looking at art, if you might say. Um, but there are still a lot of barriers that we need to break down. Well, that's the beautiful thing about art is it also does spark conversation. Mm -hmm. And you hope that's the case with some of these pieces as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think many of them are, they're unusual. They're, some are political, some are very personal and they are intended to get people talking and to get re people really looking hard at them and thinking about what kind of message it is that the artist is trying to convey that I mean, that is the power and the beauty of art and why art is so important in our society. How do you come up with um, some of the shows that you're going to be putting on? <laughs> well, we set aside a certain number of exhibition slots every year for what we call invitationals. That is, an artist usually will come to us with an idea for a show. So, for example, this show um, was the the idea of the artist Donna Jackson, who works with us in various other ways, but she had this idea for a show cooking in the back of her mind and, um, and proposed it to us. We do an open call for shows on our website. So if people um, have ideas for shows, they can come to us and do them. The other part of our exhibition program are juried shows. And our next show will be a show that is juried from, and you can submit if you're a member or if you're not a member. Um, so, uh, so that, and that show will be, that'll be really wonderful. We do three or four juried shows every year. What goes into picking some of the artists? Because we both know one thing about Detroit, we have so many mm -hmm. extremely talented individuals and artists, and a lot of them are doing it as a hobby instead of as a career. Are they part of the consideration and the conversation when it comes to trying to find local artists to take part in some of your shows? Well, as you said, Ronnie, Detroit is rich with artists. So we have artists everywhere. And we try to include as many artists as we can in the shows that we do, but it's very hard. And um, one of the things that I don't have to do anymore because I'm the director of the Scarab Club is jury some of the exhibitions that people submit work to. For example, the one that we have coming up, which will open the first week of March, um, there have been more than 550 images submitted for the jury and the juror can only choose like 60. So oh my goodness. It's really tough. It's really, really tough. And so, you know, we try to we try to accommodate as many artists as we can, but we're a fairly small physical institution. So, you know, it's it's really hard. But every artist is taken into consideration and we treat every artist with great seriousness. So one thing during the pandemic is a lot of people are finding themselves with more free time uh, due to the restrictions or maybe just not feeling safe to go out. Has that helped flourish the artist um, scene at all here in the city? 
I suppose so. Um, we did a show um, early on in the shutdown because, you know, we were closed from March until um, we were completely closed from March until July. And when we opened in July, we did a show called Lockdown where we asked artists to submit the work that they were doing when they couldn't go anywhere. So I do think a lot of artists have ended up spending a lot more time in the studio than they ever thought or hoped that they would be able to. Um, but, but one thing that we have done um, during this closure or during this time when we can't really gather is to make a virtual cl class, if you will, out of um, drawing from a live model. The Scarab Club has always been known for having sessions where artists can come and draw from a, a live model who's posing in the, in the gallery. But now we can't do that because we can't bring that many people in the building, so we do it online. And it's done over Zoom and people like it very much. And it's open to anyone. All they have to do is sign up on our website. So we've really tried to make it try to encourage artists to stay active during this time too because it is kind of depressing after a while to not be able to go out and see each other um, but making art and even virtually hanging out with people who are making art um, really helps alleviate some of the some of the claustrophobia that we might all be feeling it, for some artists it's that um spark, that organic spark of individuals that can help with their creativity in that process. But, you know, you had mentioned you're not an artist. Are you intimidated at all being around some of these extremely talented people? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. We have such wonderful artists in this community, which is one of the exciting things about my job. So, I mean, they're Artists, artists are wonderful people, you know, smart, sensitive, in tune with all kinds of things. And they, and it comes out through the, through the work that they make. So yeah, it's kind of intimidating, but it's, it's so rewarding to get to know artists. And that's, that's one of the things that you can do at the Scarab Club, uh, because during regular times, not during now, but during regular times, it's a place where people can come and meet artists, where artists can come and meet artists. I mean, that's, that's the, the fun of it, really. So I have no artistic talent. I can't even do a stick figure. And I have a brother that is so artistic. He can do anything and everything. And it's amazing to watch. I always say that he stole our talent because he's right above my twin sister and I. Uh, and it goes back to that argument. Can you teach someone some of these skills? But a lot of people are just born with it. And it's uh, when you don't have those artistic talents, you sit back in awe of some of these individuals. Oh, I feel your pain. I don't have I don't have any talent like that either. I'm a writer and a and that's that's what I do mostly is write about art and think about art and talk about art, but I don't make art myself. So I have nothing but admiration for the people who do. But see, they need people like us because we're there to appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And to tell other people about it because artists usually are not really very good at promoting themselves either. Um, but to bring works together in exhibitions, to bring artists together in social situations, that's really important. Um, and it's important not only for the people who make art, but for the people who appreciate art too, or who want to appreciate art. So with that, uh, tell us, um, when can people come and visit the show? Do they have to have a reservation or how are you guys um, handling that sign? We, they do not need a reservation. We are open from Wednesday through Sunday from 12 noon to 5 p.m. Um, and people can just walk in. We do have a, a limit of the number of people we can have in the building at one time, but people are reluctant to go out. And now that the cold, the cold weather has come, it's, it's even harder. So um, chances are you'll be able to get into the building. It won't be a problem. And we have parking right next to the building. So it's very easy. Well, I did um, catch some of the images. I know Fox 2 recently did a story uh, with some of the artists and such powerful, uh, powerful artwork there right now. The show is called Souls of Black Folk, Bearing Our Truth. Go take a little bit of time, break out of the monotony of our days 
and uh, shake it up and go appreciate some of the local work from some of our local artists. Marianne, always great having you with us here on the show. Thanks so much, Ronnie. We wish you the best in 2021. Thank you, and the same to you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be checking in with our favorite bartender, Mandy Jean from the Brew House. This is the Oakland County Megacast. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Welcome back to the second hour of the Mega Cast. We want to say thank you again to the Parks Department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Mega Cast on their Facebook page. And as a reminder, if you missed a portion of the interview or if you want to go back and watch other interviews, you can do so just by going to civiccentertv.com and clicking on the Mega Cast um, button. Uh, there you can watch full episodes of the On Demand. You can catch some of the individual uh, interviews as well. With us now uh, for this kicking off the second hour is Mandy Jean. She's our favorite bartender over at the brew house. Mandy, always great having you with us. Always good to be here. Uh, so it's been a tough year <laughs> for you and so many other people that work in the restaurant industry. You were finally able to get back to work. How are things going? Um, it's it's really good to see everyone, and it's really good to uh, be able to be back at work. Uh, obviously, with 25% capacity, you can't really have too much going on, but um, it's something. It's something. Yeah, because we should let people know that uh, while a lot of restaurants were able to stay open during the pause for carry out or outdoor dining, the brew house did not do so just for economic reasons. And so you were out of work that entire time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I know we talked the last time a little bit about the unemployment situation. We like to talk to people who are living um, the headlines that our politicians like to talk about to, you know, so when they t say, hey, the grant's coming, money is coming. Were you able to take advantage of some of those programs? Um, I did apply for uh, one grant. Um, we probably won't hear back until the end of this month at least. But um, I got my stimulus, I got the $600, but I haven't received any unemployment since mid-December because I can't get a hold of anybody and it just stopped. <laughs> but, but your bills don't stop, right? No, the bills are still rolling in. <laughs> so for you, being able to go back to work must have been a huge relief. 
it, it really was. It helps me at least know I'll be able to start getting everything handled. So, of course, um, 25% capacity. Um, is it enough for you to be able to um, make your bills and want to continue in this industry? Are you worried that there's going to be another shutdown around the corner? Um, 25% capacity, I think, is a little... That's... I think 50% capacity would be better like we had before because that was perfectly fine for us to still pay our bills and still be able to do what we need to do. Um, but 25% capacity just really isn't, it's not that many. It's not that much. Especially when you're in a small establishment uh, such as the brew house. And we should note that the brew house has been a part of the Kegel Harbor community for, oh goodness, who knows, um, 40 plus years, I think. It may have gone through name changes, but it's been at that location there um, on Orchard Lake uh, near Cass Lake forever. Uh, but was it like a family seeing everyone again? Oh yeah, like honestly, it was. I mean, people that we even, you know, like teared up a couple times seeing people walk in and being able to talk to people and see how they're doing. And it, it was really nice. Have you ever given any thought of the because of the pandemic, maybe saying, I'm done with the restaurant industry, I am leaving? Honestly, no. I I love what I do and I love where I work. And I honestly couldn't see myself anything else for right now. I have plans for, you know, the future, you know, five, ten years from now, but not right now. So I know that uh, for you, you mainly do work days, but there is a 10 o'clock curfew. Yep. How's that impacted business? Um, it's impacted it a lot. Um, a lot of the night girls, uh, that's some of their busier times or their better money making times. And so we split the schedule. So everyone's on shorter shifts. So I get off at four rather than seven. And what does that uh, mean overall for you? Are you still able to even collect unemployment? Let's say if they get your unemployment up and going, would you still be able to collect it because you're not making as much money? I mean, I think I would be able to, but I'm not really sure. I'd have to talk to unemployment and when I can actually get a hold of them and figure it out. And so we should note, uh, John and Jeff, the owners, we've asked them to be on the show and they're very shy. They don't okay. want to. Uh, and they're very proud. You know, um, for them, this is a huge loss out of their pockets as well, trying to keep this business going and keep it in our neighborhood. Yeah, it's, it's a huge loss for them. They've, they've suffered greatly and they've, you know, they're just trying to keep their spirit alive for us. And we're trying to help, you know, keep there's like our spirit alive for them. Like it's, you know, they've, they've tried grants too. They haven't even gotten to be able to get anything. They've had zero help. So, um, and we've talked with other restaurant owners um, before on the show and they talk about trying to apply for the grants and, you know, within like the first five minutes, the money is gone. And so very few people are able to take advantage of some of these in the meantime, uh, businesses are shutting down. Mandy, does it worry you when you hear that more than 3,000 restaurants have already closed in the state of Michigan? It does a little. It does a little. If Brew House closed, it'd definitely break a lot of hearts. Um, it would be very tragic. How long have you worked over there now? Uh, next month will be four years. Four years. Yep. In the neighborhood. <laughs> How do you even find the brew house out of all the restaurants in the area? Um, I actually, well, I moved here and then I, my first bartending job was actually Bachelor Ones. And then when they had sold it to turn it into Doc and June's, uh, what, um, I used to go up to brew house and see other people and uh, they pretty much said, hey, we have an opening here. And I was like, I'm on it. Like, I want to. And so you've lasted all this time. I will say, I miss Doc and June's nachos. <laughs> when they had the nachos, they had it. You know, um, those were so good. Everyone looks at me like I'm crazy when I say, hey, they had the best nachos because they were made differently. I don't know how they did it, but. Yeah. So uh, with that, Mandy, what do you want people to know if they've never been into the brew house? What's the atmosphere? It's cheers. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone's super friendly. Um, 
we like to joke around, laugh, just honestly, it's just a good time. We have really good food and just the, the people who work there, the customers, everyone are just amazing. It really is, uh, you know, a neighborhood bar where everyone knows your name and they also know your business. But we should say uh, the brew house is probably best known for back in the day before the lodge opened. They used to do the big, huge Christmas benefit for Killer Kowalski's um, and for the kids of Kiko Harbor. And that's actually how I became familiar with the place. All the sports people in Detroit used to hang out there. Uh, and so it really has been a place all these years about giving back and trying to help the community as well. And I know Jeff and John have continued that legacy as well. Absolutely. They do, they do, you know, donate to a lot of charities and help out in the community. And it's nice to know that I have bosses that do care about their community. So Mandy, there are so many rules and regulations, and then you have the capacity, and this is a small place you're usually working by yourself with maybe just, you know, uh, someone else there with you in the kitchen. Um, are you worried again about your health or because um, right now you can't get the vaccine? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're doing what we can, you know, we wear our masks. We, I'm constantly washing my hands. I'm constantly sanitizing things. Um, it's, it's kind of a gamble. I, I mean, I can't stay locked in my house forever. I have to be able to work. Um, until I can get that vaccine, I just got to be extra cautious. So I know that uh, frontline workers are included, um, like grocery store workers. They're trying to push to get like Uber drivers and Lyft drivers and also people who work in the restaurants. If we're able, you're able to get it, will you get the vaccine? Do you have any hesitancy? I mean, there's obviously everyone has some kind of hesitancy, but um, I will 100% be getting it. Um, my boyfriend's dad has cancer, you know, um, his sister-in-law has an immune deficiency. I don't want to risk their life. So what's it been like for you working uh, in a public place and being around people who are uh, immune compromised? Um, before we shut down again, we did outdoor visits. Um, after we shut down again, you know, we kind of stuck to ourselves here and then we were able to go visit them. And now that I'm back to work, it's either outdoor visits or I'm not sure we haven't seen them or we probably won't be able to see them for a little while. Yeah, because you're not doing an outdoor visit right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not worth risking their health. Uh, so have you been during the shutdown, um, have you gone out to other restaurants and taken advantage to, of some of those outdoor dining um, setups that they have, such as the igloos and the cooler, or, you know, garden sheds and things of that nature? Yes, I went to Fork and Pint and I went to B1 when they had theirs. Um, what was your experience like? Um, I really liked Fork and Pine's atmosphere in there. You know what I mean? Um, B1 was great, obviously. I had Ashley as a server. She's wonderful. Um, it, it was nice. It was a little chillier, but, you know, I was able to, you know, go out and have a meal that I wasn't cooking for the past hour. <laughs> right. I'm so tired of cooking. Um, but with that, though, some of those, uh, we've done the garden shed. I do like the garden sheds um, that they have at B1s now, but they're still pretty cold while they're, you know, they do their best. They put an electric heater in there and you definitely yeah. want to bring your own blanket, which gives yeah. new meaning to BYOB, right? Uh, but it is still cold. So maybe, you know, 20, 30 degrees you can sit out there, but right now when it's nine, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think I'll be doing any outdoor dining. I'm not from Michigan. I'm still not used to the winters. <laughs> so, hey, uh, Mandy, how are the tips been? Have people been very generous during this time? Because I know that there was a big push, like during the first shutdown, support local, you know, get the carry out. But I felt like that kind of was, you know, waning a little bit during the second pause, per se, because yeah. people were tired of the message. But now that they're able to come back into the establishment, what's it been like? Um, you know, there, people have been generous, you know, um, it's, it's been okay. Like I, I can't complain because, you know, I'm able to, you know, put food on my 
able and pay some bills now. And, and people have been very generous and kind. And that's why I'm glad I kind of work in a place that, you know, everybody knows everyone and everyone knows who you are. And they're, they're there to support you. They're there to care for you. They're, they're happy to see you. Is there anyone you were happy to see? <laughs> we won't, we won't make you answer that one, Mandy. That I'm not happy to see? Yeah, you know, because some customers, um, I know the first round, cu some customers would just get kind of, um, you know, like a little cranky with the wait staff about some of the rules and the regulations. But this time around, are you still having those situations or is it we're all just used to it? I mean, I haven't really been impacted with customers being too cranky about anything, you know, um, but if Everyone seems a lot happier this time around. Yeah, because they, they miss it. It's like, oh, yeah. wow. Well, maybe I should just, you know, be nice. But <laughs> and on top of that, you know, uh, yeah, while they were able to take advantage of being outdoors, this time at least they can come indoors. So it's like, I should be nice because I don't want to be back outdoors when it's uh, nine degrees outside. Yeah, I didn't really have too many problems with, you know, regulars or anything getting upset either time, like really, not at all, at least during the day. I don't know how it was at night when they first came back, um, but um, it's mostly more people who have never been there, I'd say, who were a little bit more upset. Yeah, it, so if, if the restrictions are in place, for let's say the next three months, the next six months. Um, do you think that you're going to be able to survive in the industry at, at those uh, restriction levels? Honestly, I couldn't tell you whether or not yes or no, but I mean, I, I think we'll do okay. I mean, I won't be able to, you know, go out as much or do certain things or, you know, but it, it's just, just cutting back stuff that's not necessities. That's all it is. Uh, right. I'm be able to pay my bills, you know, and feed my animals, but it's necessities I'll have to cut back and that's okay. Well, the good news is that the numbers are going down, but the big concern of course is the variant and that uh, if that could um, allow for wider spread of the virus, which could keep these restrictions in place. But um, let's hope that uh, they're lifted soon, like you said, at least 50% capacity. And um, But I think that 10 o'clock curfew is going to be around for a while. I, I think so, too. I think the 10 o'clock curfew will. But, I mean, we just have to make do with what we have. You you just, like, you just got to count your blessings. This is a time that you just have to count your blessings and be thankful for what you have. Yep. And be grateful and support the restaurants that are able to survive because even though they are reopened, it's still going to be tough going for the next few months. Mandy, always great having you. It is always good to see you. Again, for those that haven't been to the brew house, um, where are you guys located? Uh, we're off um, Orchard Lake and Cass Lake Road, uh, off Orchard Lake Road in Kego Harbor, off Willow Beach. I think like the street next door is Willow Beach. Well, it is a neighborhood staple here. And um, so Mandy is very well known uh, for taking care of her customers because bartending is an art just like anything else. It's about the customer service. So I know that they're happy to have you over there and we're happy to have you as well. Thank you, Ronnie. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, everyone go visit uh, Mandy over at the brew house. Uh, stop by and support your local restaurants as well. And uh, get, get outside of the cold. Go inside, stay warm, and stay healthy. Thanks again, Mandy. Thank you, Ronnie. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. 
our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios while Mr. Tyler Keefe holds things down for us back in West Bloomfield. And just to let you know, I'll be jumping out of the show a little bit early today um, to uh, go. I do media training for first responders, so I have that this afternoon, and Tyler will be taking over the last interview. But before I go, always great to have our next guest here with us, Dr. Ronald Letterman. He's the orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine doctor over for the Center of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back, Doc. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. How are you? You know, we're surviving. If it maybe about 70 degrees warmer, it would be better. You know, I was just snowshoeing last night uh, in about 15 degrees. And as long as you're moving and active and generating the heat, it's it's amazing out there in the crisp air. It's pretty to look at from the inside. But <laughs> do you use like uh, the heated jackets and the heated vest? Um, I've got heated gloves. And I've learned through my biking with my group that if you layer up, you can stay warm. Obviously, in these really cold temperatures, you have to layer, layer up. You want to get the hand and toe warmers, and you want to be very careful with any exposed area of the body. So I have a story for you about the uh, toe warmers. You'll like this one. I uh, was covering, um, oh gosh, it was like some hockey game at U of M a few years ago on New Year's Day. I forget who was playing, but it was so cold that I put toe warmers and hand warmers, obviously I was using, but the toe warmers, and yes, I had two pairs of socks. I put them in between, but it was so cold outside because you were stuck outside for hours that um, I ended up with like a second degree burns on the bottom of my feet, but they were so numb. I couldn't feel them getting so hot from the toe warmers. Those are very effective toe warmers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? They were just the dollar ones. And everyone's like, you're not supposed to put them directly on your feet. I'm like, I didn't. I had socks on. But that first layer of socks, you know, I had, they were thinner. And so, um, but yeah, I learned my lesson on that one. And of wow. course, my doctor, he thought I was crazy when I went in and I said, hey, uh, doc, I think I burnt the bottom of my feet. <laughs> So with that, though, um, as you were just saying, I know the last time we had you on, we talked a lot about some of the injuries that we can sustain and how to keep ourselves safe in the cold winter months and watching out for the ice and things like that. But uh, today we want to really talk to you more about stem cells. And this is really a fascinating area of medicine. For those, like, break it down to us, the very basics. What are stem cells? Stem cells are, are very specialized cells that have the ability to differentiate to, into what they're needed. So on, on the regeneration front, if you can get a stem cell to grow new cartilage, theoretically you'd have the cure for arthritis. If you can get stem cells to regrow new pancreas cells, you'd have the cure for diabetes. Uh, so 
stem cells is still experimental and we're still a long ways off from growing a new heart or pancreas or even cartilage. But I will tell you our experience at Letterman Quartets Orthopedics has been incredible. And it's more of a, we started it as a regenerative medicine program, hoping that the studies in the laboratory on animals that showed growth of new cartilage would grow new cartilage in any of us that could minimize the effects of arthritis. Arthritis hurts and it affects quality of life in a nutshell. And every day I go into work and every day Dr. Kordowitz and Dr. O'Keefe and, and all of the doctors at Letterman Kordowitz, we see people that are hurting. And the good news is way more often than not, we can do things that help people with their pain. The regenerative stem cell program we started two and a half years ago, we started with the hope of growing new cartilage in a younger person, 20, 30, 40 years old that had cartilage damage in their knee, in their shoulder, wherever it may be. And what we discovered is that we can't really prove that it's growing new cartilage, but almost every single patient that we injected these stem cell, uh, stem cell type materials into just about every joint got, if not complete, then significant pain relief. It has been a game changer for people that really want relief without having to go through a big surgery. You know, I remember years ago when Michigan um, was passing the law to allow for stem cell research. What is the controversy surrounding this arena of medicine? That's a great question. To do stem cell research, you are typically harvesting very young embryonic cells from either an embryo, uh, maybe an aborted fetus. Uh, you can imagine the controversy that that creates and it, and it goes so far beyond our discussion today, but here's the beauty. The stem cells and the material that we are injecting into our patients is from the donated tissue after a healthy newborn delivery of either the umbilical cord or from the amniotic tissue of the placenta. So it's donated by the mother after they've had a healthy newborn delivery. So there's no real controversy there. Um, and then this, this tissue, there's a few handful of quality companies around the country that prepare this tissue and it's expensive, unfortunately, but it comes to us in a little vial that we actually put in a deep liquid nitrogen freeze right there in our office. So when people come to Letterman Quartets Orthopedics and they say, hey, I heard about this regenerative program or stem cell, my knee, my shoulder, my hip, my ankle is killing me. I don't want surgery or I'm not healthy enough to have surgery. We can do it the same day. We'll evaluate them, take x-rays and see if we believe it would help. And interestingly enough, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that we thought this was going to be for the young athlete that had an injury and had a small little area of cartilage damage because we went into this thinking we can maybe regrow new cartilage. Maybe. We can't promise or guarantee anything. But as we saw the pain relief for arthritic joints or the accelerated healing of Achilles tendonitis and tennis elbow and other tendon issues, we started getting older patients, and I mean in the 80s and 90s, that have got awful arthritis, they're not healthy enough to have surgery, they're coming and getting these injections, and they're coming back a month later, two months later, asking for the other knee or the other hip or the other shoulder, because they cannot believe how much their quality of life has improved, because they can now walk again. They don't have the pain that they, the debilitating pain they were experiencing. It's very exciting. So what is the recovery time? And is, is this something once you have one injection, do you have to keep coming back? So we don't know that yet. I can tell you, we started this program about two and a half years ago. Now, personally, I had 20 years ago, a bad ski injury and I got slammed into the mountain. My shoulder dislocated, it popped back in and I never had surgery on the shoulder, but over the next few years, the pain was horrible. This shoulder pain kept me awake. I couldn't sleep on this side. It would wake me up three, four, five times a night. It affected my quality of life so dramatically 
And I actually was the first patient to get my stem cell injection in my office two and a half years ago. I couldn't move my arm before, and now I can sleep on my shoulder. I'm back to doing push-ups, and it's been remarkable. So when we found that, it's an injection in the office that we use uh, ultrasound guidance for. So we know exactly where we want to put it. We want every drop of this liquid gold to get where it needs to get, and there's no recovery. I was back to doing whatever I was doing, but it will take anywhere from four to eight weeks for the pain relief to kick in. Whether I'm growing new cartilage in my shoulder or not, I don't know. My x-rays do show arthritis, and that's why I got the injection. Hold off the arthritis, maybe not need a shoulder replacement in five or 10 years. But I have, I have such amazing function, and I can do everything I want to do. I think less about new cartilage growth and more about all the things I can do again. So what needs to happen to make this more mainstream and also more affordable? I wish I knew the answer. You know, when, when you're dealing with insurance companies, and I, I'm sure you have friends that, you know, doctors are notorious about complaining about the pressures of Blue Cross and the, they keep, you know, reimbursing less and making it more difficult. I mean, we all had to go out and buy uh, electronic medical records. And uh, to do that, you need software and licensing fees. And it just increases the cost of just running a practice when all you want to do is help people. And then, of course, Medicare kind of they do the same thing. So that's government. You know, I don't know the answer to that, Ronnie. My hope is that when enough people get benefit from this, then it will create a bit of a groundswell of support and reaching out to your congressperson, senators to say, you know, this needs to be covered. It, it really does, because you're looking at um, in the long run, saving money as well, because if you can avoid those surgeries, that's so going that's to be really, better for the patient. That's a really good point, and that's probably the key point. The studies now have to show that long-term, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, it actually alters the course of the disease. That's called arthritis, the disease here. And I will say this. As I sit here, I can't assure or promise someone that their bone-on-bone -bone arthritis won't still need a knee or a hip or a shoulder replacement in five or 10 years. But one thing I can say with certainty after all the experience we've had is you're gonna hurt a lot less, you're gonna do a lot more, you're gonna have a lot more uh, quality of life. And so here's my question. For someone that wants to kick the can down the road a little bit, is that worth it to them? And the prevailing answer is absolutely yes. And I think even the people making the decisions at Blue Cross or Medicare or the politicians might say, we can't approve it because we can't guarantee you won't need the joint replacement, but every one of them would come in and want to get one if they can feel great for two years or four years or six years. Most definitely. What do you think the future of this is? It's only going to improve. It's going to get better. Like anything with research, the, the brain power behind all of this is remarkable. Just like the vaccines. Who thought we could have gotten a safe vaccine within months and not years. And uh, I hope you've gotten vaccine, although you're way too young probably. But me and everyone in our office, just about everyone at Letterman Quarters Orthopedics has gotten vaccinated. It is safe, people need to do that. That's a little sidebar, I'm done with that soapbox. <laughs> but to answer your question, the research will continue and it will show that it benefits people. To what degree? Only until you get millions of people that you can you really tell. But right now in our small little study at Letterman Quarter with Orthopedics, 95 plus percent of patients are so happy with the results that they're telling family and friends and, and it's safe. There's been no side effect. So, you know, we will continue to offer this to people that have any interest in non-surgical dramatic pain relief of their arthritis uh, or tendons. I might've mentioned earlier, Achilles tendonitis often can lead to a rupture. Then you're talking about surgery and you're hobbling for up to a year. We've been doing these injections into Achilles, avoiding the rupture, showing MRIs of complete re, um, restoration of normal Achilles tissue. 
without surgery and without any significant downtime. So I think it's cutting edge technology and cutting edge uh, medicine for orthopedics. The medical world really is fascinating. It, but like when, if you were able to get the shot, um, is there a physical therapy program that goes along with it? Or is it just the shot in the arm or the, wherever you need it and then you're on your way? I am a huge believer in physical therapy. You know, we have on-site physical therapy at Letterman Quarter. It's right there in the Lakes Medical Center. And actually, we are just within a week or two opening up a satellite location further east for our patients that come from even Clinton Township. So we're going to have an office at 13 Mile and Telegraph, which will make it easier for the greater metro area. Um, but physical therapy after for treatment for any tendonitis or arthritis, I think, is critical for an arthritic joint. You work on improved range of motion and you want to strengthen the muscles around that joint, which can act as shock absorbers to take pressure off the arthritic joint. So to answer your question, when we do a stem cell regenerative type treatment into a joint, always physical therapy. And our, our therapist on site there at LKO know exactly what to do. And the same thing if somebody ends up needing surgery. We're big believers in pre-op therapy, which is called prehab. Now the literature has shown that that's beneficial. So insurance companies have actually approved prehab. And then you wanna do post-op physical therapy very aggressively as well. Uh, so um, what about for, could this help with people with frozen shoulder and some of those other issues like that? Absolutely, frozen shoulder is an enigma. We don't really know why people get it other than it can be as simple as just, they tweaked their shoulder, they stepped on it funny, they babied it for a week or so, and it started freezing in the, that position. Physical therapy is huge for that. Uh, cortisone injections have been shown beneficial, but we've also done PRP, which is the plasma rich protein. Now that's not stem cell, but PRP is where we draw blood from our patients. We spin it down in a centrifuge, and then we're left with this plasma rich protein mix, which does have some regenerative process properties. And we are, able to inject those into shoulders, hips, knees. Uh, and some people are more comfortable with that because it's their own tissue. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. But uh, when we're talking about injections, what size needle are we talking about here? <laughs> I'm Very, a baby when it comes to needles. <laughs> everybody is kind of a baby. I'll admit to it as well. Who wants a big needle? So when we started investing in on-site ultrasound units, we put our ultrasound probe, just like you get when, you know, with the baby, when someone's pregnant, right around the joint, it helps us direct the injection right where it needs to go, which allows us to use a really tiny 25 gauge needle. Most patients don't even feel our injections and they can't believe how easy it is at our office. Little needles I can handle. Well, they're tiny. And you know what, <laughs> just as a, a, for current events there, here, 12 years ago, Tom Brady made PRP popular by getting plasma-rich protein of his own into his Achilles tendonitis. It was 12 years ago. He was a baby. He was 31 years old. But, um, you know, he, he's, he's a miracle doing what he's done for so long. Uh, but there is a lot of validity to the plasma-rich protein regenerative type injections and the stem cell regenerative type injections. And we're going to keep offering it to our patients um, because we believe very strongly it helps a lot of people. And what do you think the future of this is? I think the future is that it will become more recognized, but there are a lot of treatments that people have done considered alternative medicine that they've done for 10, 15, 20 years, and it's still not approved by insurance. And that's the big thing, you know, who can afford these treatments and who can't. And for people that really need it and can't afford it, we work very hard to make it as affordable as possible for everyone. Uh, but it, it's, um, it's just not there yet for insurance to cover it across the board. People can pay for these treatments with their healthcare, you know, their, their HSA accounts or flexible spending accounts, which helps. So we're trying to do everything we can to make it affordable and easy enough for everyone or anyone to get it. 
But it really is fascinating, the research that's going into this and the advancements in the medical world. And uh, it's great to have people such as yourself knowledgeable in these arenas and these areas to be able to offer the services uh, to the public. Uh, Doc, anything we didn't touch on that you want to share before we say goodbye to you today? Um, We're we're still offering the MLS laser, which we've done for about six years. We've treated over 3,200 patients. We've kept track of every patient and every diagnosis. And the most common diagnoses are injuries, sprains, arthritis, tendonitis, and we're still running a 91.5% success rate with the laser. It's a robotic technology, robotic laser technology that's in our physical therapy. So for patients to kill two birds with one stone, they get their on-site physical therapy with the laser treatment. And, you know, our goal is to get people better faster and to get them better without having to undergo surgery. It's exactly what I would want my own family members to get. And that's what we offer to everyone. And that's great. We're lucky to have you here in our community. Uh, Again, I know you just mentioned you guys are expanding 13 and Telegraph area. When do you expect that to open? Hopefully within a week or two. And we should have all that information on our website at lkorthopedics.com. So LK Orthopedics spelled the easy way, orthopedics with a P-E-D-I-C-S. But um Yeah, we just want to reach as many people as possible. Well, uh, thank you again for being with us and good luck with the expansion. And uh, also uh, the the fascinating industry with the stem cell. And let's hope that uh, it does become more widely available so that the insurance companies will start covering it. Well, hopefully they're listening to you as well. I agree with you. We're going to take having me. It's always great having you. We always learn so much uh, when you are with us here on the show. So we appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. They seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months you know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. Just a few more minutes left in our show today. And before we let you go, we want to give you some information on where you can learn more about our partnering stations, Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, the BIF online, and, and where you can find all the content from today's edition of the Megacast, as well as our other episodes past and in the future. All of that is on our website at Civic Center TV. Dot com. And you'll see it now on your screen, our home page. There are several resources to go to. First, what I'd like to point you towards is next week, Thursday, we will be partnering with Henry Ford, West Bloomfield Hospital, the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce, West Bloomfield Parks, and West Bloomfield Township holding a COVID-19 town hall all about the vaccine. It'll be at 9 o'clock in the morning on Thursday next week, February 18th, leading into our regular episode of the Oakland County Megacast. We are going to have Eric Wallace, the president of the 
Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital will have Dr. Manu Moholtra, as well as Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital's infectious disease expert, Dr. Chen. All of them will be joining us on that. We'll be taking questions from the audience and from out in the community as well, some that we have prepared and others that you have prepared as well. We want to hear from you. So here's another place I'm going to have you go. I would like you also to go, if you have questions about the vaccine, and I know you have questions about the vaccine, we all have questions about the vaccine. There's so many of them. It, it's all different information. We're hearing it from all different places, some of it not accurate. We're going to be talking to experts on the front line in your community, right in your backyard, people that know you, people that know your neighbors and have treated you and your family. They can answer those questions. So. What I want you to do, if you have questions about the COVID-19 vaccines and you want them answered by experts who will speak directly to you, we want you to go to the West Bloomfield Township website, wbtownship.org. On that website, if you scroll down, you will see COVID-19 vaccine town hall megacast. Clicking on that link, you will have options here. You'll view the flyer, learn more details about the event, see the press release, learn more details about the event and here is an option to click to submit questions in advance now a couple different things you you can do you can submit them as a text question in the email or what we would prefer you to do and what we really would like you to do so we can have the community involved in the show just record a short video attach that video to the to the message that you are sending at that link and we will have your question for these experts potentially being aired on that special COVID-19 vaccine town hall megacast that we will air at nine o'clock Thursday, February 18th, one week from tomorrow, right here on Civic Center TV and on the big 89, 89.3 Lakes FM. Again, West Bloomfield Township's website, wbtownship.org has that in addition on our homepage if you click on the uh, if you click on the flag we have at the top of our screen about the COVID-19 vaccine town hall, it will take you directly to that page as well. Just a minute left in the show. Let's go through some other resources on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Up-to-date news each and every day, your top stories from around the area. You don't have to cycle through all the different news outlets all morning long to figure out what's going on with COVID-19 and other top news stories in the local area. We have links to those most important articles and we summarize them. Ronnie does a great job every morning summarizing the most important details in just a couple of paragraphs. And we go over that every day on the show as well. And in addition, links to reputable resources on COVID-19 nationally, statewide, locally in your municipalities and from the county where you can sign up to get your COVID-19 vaccine when and if, when you are eligible. Lastly, with 20 seconds to go, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Full episodes, short clips, full interviews on demand when you are ready and able to watch our content. If you don't have a lot of time, clips. If you only want certain information, interviews. If you want to watch full shows, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. That's it for today's edition of the show. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. to 12 noon. This is the Oakland County Megacast.